coming up on this episode of Crime Family. This is the story of the Pickering Lost Boys, a group of six teenage boys who went missing after a house party on March 17th, 1995 in Pickering, Ontario, Canada. So however, the girls, even though they reported the boys missing, the police did not consider the call important or a priority at all. They just told the girls to have the boys' mothers call the station the next day to make a report if they still weren't back by that time. A body of a male was recovered from the Niagara River by Niagara Regional Police. And so according to reports by the Ontario coroner, the following details about these remains were noted. It's very odd to me that all six of them just drowned and nobody found any evidence of anything. Like, that's just weird to me. So, so I think this whole thing just revolves around the boat. I think if you find the boat, you find the people. And that's what I'm sticking to. Welcome back to Crime Family. This week, it's just Stephanie and I um, for for this episode. Katie, unfortunately, has the flu, so she is not able to be with us. So I feel like um, it's been a few weeks since we've all been together. Um, I was out the last episode um, for technical issues, which have thankfully been resolved, um, and now Katie's sick. So just Stephanie and I tonight, um, but we'll get started. This week, I'm going to be telling the story of an unsolved mystery that happened in Ontario, Canada back in the 1990s. Despite the very mysterious circumstances of the case and the media attention that it has attracted, It still remains unsolved to this day. This is the story of the Pickering Lost Boys, a group of six teenage boys who went missing after a house party on March 17th, 1995 in Pickering, Ontario, Canada. Have you ever heard of this case before? No, I've never heard of it. Like it did receive some media attention, of course, when it first happened, and there's been podcasts and stuff that have done episodes on it, but it hasn't been like super well known, so not surprising that you haven't heard of it. I think I heard of it maybe a couple of years ago. I just kind of heard about it, but didn't really look too far into it. Um, But it is actually quite an interesting and weird case. Um, So I'm excited to to get into it. So Pickering, Ontario is a part of the greater Toronto area, and it's located on Lake Ontario. So it has a population of about 100,000 people. Uh, The population back in 1995, though, was only about 78,000. And it is located about 40 kilometers east of Toronto. On March 16th, The day before St. Patrick's Day in 1995, six teenage boys, Chad Smith, aged 18, Jay Boyle, aged 17, Jamie Lefebvre, aged 17, Michael Cummins, aged 17, Danny Higgins, aged 16, and Robbie Rumbolt, aged 18, attended a party being held in town. So I don't really know much about these six boys and their lives before this night, other than the fact that Jay had a young child with his girlfriend at the time that this case began. Um, But for the rest of the boys, unfortunately, we don't know much about any of them. We don't know anything about them before they went missing and this case started. So there isn't a a ton of information. And that's kind of the, the, that's kind of the case with all of the information in this, in this case. There's not a lot of information out there. Like I said, there are some podcasts, there is a couple of websites and news articles, but you know, there isn't like a big documentary or anything like that. So it's really hard to find a lot of information or consistent information. A lot of the sources have conflicting dates and conflicting information. So I'm going to try to like present it in a non-confusing way, but sometimes it does get a little confusing with the change of information among sources. Like I said, these six boys um, went out to a party on the night of March 16th into the early morning hours of March 17th. And including the six of them, there were about 50 people at this party. 
At about 12.50 a.m., the six boys decided to leave the party together and head to Frenchman's Bay. And this was an area and a marina where many teenagers would go to hang out and party and kind of drink late at night. So it was kind of known for among teenagers anyway, as kind of being a place to do that. Um, a specific reason that they left the party to go to Frenchman's Bay is not known. Like they didn't say, you know, that they were going to be meeting anyone or that they were going to be doing something sp like specific. Um, other teenagers at the party told investigators that the boys said they would be back before sunrise and that they were going to, quote, goof around, end quote. But as to what goof around entails specifically, like that information wasn't known to the people at the party or at least not that they said to investigators were these six people were they friends or were they not known to each other they were just at the same party they were all friends with each other okay I'm, sorry i don't know if you said that or not oh no yeah i don't think i did but yeah they were all friends so there was a group okay. of six friends and they okay. were all at this party together although there is that is one of the pieces with a little bit conflicting is that there is some sources that say that there was like an argument between the two, two of the boys that night and one of them left the party early. So it was only five of them that were there that left. But other sources kind of say it was all six that were there. So I'm just going to go with that there were six people. From my understanding, they were close friends. Uh, all six of them were pretty close um, from the information that I could see anyway. So the next event in the timeline was at about 1.30 a.m when Jay Boyle called his girlfriend Monique Babala. In this call, Jay told Monique that he and two of the boys were planning on going for a joyride on a water tricycle. So if you don't know what that is or you've never seen one, it's just kind of this kind of big like watercraft. It's like it has huge big wheels. Um, it's like a tricycle that you ride in the water, I guess of some description. So he called her and said that he and his friends were planning on going for a joyride on one of these water tricycles, but Monique was able to talk him out of that. Um, and, you know, he she convinced him that that wasn't a good idea. So Jay then said that he, Robbie, and Michael would come over to her apartment. Um, but the three boys never showed up. At about 1.48 a.m., Michael, Robbie, and Jamie can be seen on surveillance footage. A water tricycle and a four-meter motorboat known as a Boston Whaler along with a case of beer, were stolen from the marina by the boys, but the boat being stolen was not captured on the tape. So um, they've kind of just put the pieces together that based on, you know, a report of a missing boat and the fact that the three boys were seen on surveillance footage near the boat at the marina, that the boys did take that boat, even though it's not physically seen on the camera. So on, on, the, on the camera, what they see or what you can see is just kind of the three of the boys kind of walking walking in a straight line past through the view of the camera, but no other like specific information or anything of note really on, like at that part of the tape. So to my knowledge, the, th the three other boys were not seen on surveillance footage at all. Um, so the only information that we have that Jay was actually there, because he wasn't one of the boys that was seen on the footage. It was only Michael, Robbie, and Jamie. So the only reason we know that Jay was also there was because, remember, he called his girlfriend Monique, and he said that he was there and that they were going to take the joyride. So so was this, like, was the party close to the marina where they were? Like, did they have, could they walk there, or did they have to, like, drive, or? Um, I don't really know. I think it was, you know, probably within walking distance. Um, it's not a very big place i don't believe um so i don't really know actually if they walked it or drove it but i'm just i'm just curious because i thought maybe like maybe they, someone like saw like saw the boys there or like mm -hmm. if it was like close to the party and they just happened to leave the party and walk there like walk i don't know i'm just trying to yeah so uh, like they left the party at 12 50 a.m or roughly around 12 50 and they're seen on the surveillance footage the three of them at 1 48 a.m so it is an hour later so you know they were at the marina within an hour. So even if they did walk it, it was, you know, an hour at the most of a walk, um, but probably less than that. Um, but I don't have any information about like if they drove to the party or if they drove to the marina or anything like that, or if they got a ride. Um, all I know is that an hour after they left the party, they were at the marina and seen on that footage. So Bruce Ricketts is a private investigator who began looking into this case back in 2010 and he was able to retrieve a copy of the surveillance footage during his investigation. 
And he says that he watched all of the hours of the footage that were available to him from the marina that night. So aside from the event at 148 of the three boys at the marina, he also saw two other things on the footage from that night. So one is from 12.15 a.m., where Ricketts says, quote, At 0.15, a car is seen driving into the marina. You can see it enter on camera one. It then drives towards the service area and makes a right turn to park next to a pickup truck. This is seen on camera two. Two persons get out of the car, move around the outside a couple of times, then pick up a large bag, which one tosses over his shoulder. Both persons then walk to the left across the camera view. That car remained for almost one hour before driving out. End quote. Nothing like super necessarily suspicious, but just kind of that there were other people. Now, this is a 12 15, so that would have been before the boys were there, obviously, because they didn't leave the party till 12 50. Um, but there were other people at the marina that night. Whether they were still there by the time that the boys were there, we don't know. Um, another event is, quote, the most troubling clip from the video. The clip starts at 2.09. At 2.10, three persons are seen walking into the service area from the left. They walk most of the way across the yard and stop. One person has separated away from the other two and appears to be pointing something at them. About 30 seconds after they enter the yard, they disappear. Who were they? It appears to be one male and two females. This activity occurs 20 minutes after the three boys march into the yard. Did this second trio see or hear anything? Were they identified and questioned by police? End quote. So that's all from the main website on this case that is managed by Bruce Wicketts himself. So he does have a website um, on this case, lostboysofpickering.com. And he outlines like the timeline of the case. So a lot of this information is from that. Um, and that was a direct quote kind of what his thoughts were after seeing this event from the surveillance footage at around 210. Um, so this could be completely unrelated. There is a chance that these three people witnessed something. Maybe they saw the other boys there. Maybe they were involved in something that happened. We may never know, though, because we do not know at this time if these three people were ever identified or if they were questioned by police. So all we know is that there were other people there throughout the night who may or may not have seen anything or heard anything. So we just don't know. And that's kind of the theme with much about this case is that there's just so much that we don't really know. So there also there were other people kind of walking about, you know, that night. There was also another event that was on the footage, and this one was very insignificant. It was just a person walking in the view of the camera, which I believe was around like around these same times. So at some point, um, just to kind of show that there were other people kind of in the area that night. Who... And they never identify what was in that bag or whatever, what what could could have been in that bag that the people took? No, um, I mean, as nothing that's out there. I mean, we don't really know to what extent the police really looked into anything. My guess is probably not much based on, you know. Yeah, I was just, I was just wondering, like, may, like I, it seems insignif insignificant to the, to the crime or the, the mystery. But I was just wondering, because trying to piece everything together, there's a lot of events that went on during this yeah time. so i was just trying to figure out if that yeah. had anything any significance but i probably didn't yeah and there, there's a lot of you know it's like a marina there's lots of boats there so a lot of people own these boats so there could just be people you know probably all, all, all hours of the day just kind of you know who knows <laughs> what people are doing at this hour um so the boys definitely weren't the only ones there but obviously there's nothing to say that any of these other people were involved in anything but you know they would be people that would be kind of should be followed up with by the police, you know, at the very least, but we just don't know if that happened or not um, because we don't know a ton about this case, but obviously nothing ever came out that led to anything. So I can just assume that they probably, maybe they did question these people, but my sense is probably not just based on kind of the lack of care in this case, just overall. So all of those people are kind of moving around the marina and they're kind of spotted on these cameras at different times. Um, so the other three boys, like I said, there's only three boys that were captured on the surveillance footage. So there was the other three were not captured at all. So they could have just kind of, there were two cameras at the marina. So the other three could have just kind of walked along routes that just didn't happen to be in the path of any of the cameras. So nothing like to really to make of the fact that the other three weren't on camera, but just noting that it was only the three of them that were seen. 
And there were residents who lived near Frenchman's Bay who also spoke with the police during the investigation. They say they could hear the sound of an engine from a boat starting up at about between 2.30 and 3 a.m. that morning at the marina. But again, nothing really conclusive about that either. And we can kind of just put the pieces together uh, based on the little bit of information we have. So Monique and the girlfriend of another one of the boys ended up calling the police at around 3.30 a.m. when they grew concerned that the boys didn't return and hadn't been heard from. So however, the girls, even though they reported the boys missing, the police did not consider the call important or a priority at all. They just told the girls to have the boys' mothers call the station the next day to make a report if they still weren't back by that time. So for whatever reason, the police did not seem to believe the girls. They kind of didn't think that the girls were being completely truthful with them about aspects of the disappearance. I don't really know the details of that, but the police were just kind of sketched out for whatever reason about the nature of the call or, or about the details of it. Um, and the report that was done on this initial call, because of course there has to be reports written from every you know, police interaction or call. Um, so the report about this call was only written about a week after it happened. And that was only when Officer Gillum was requested to do so by his supervisor. So if it wasn't even for that, he wouldn't have even written a report. Um, so it is extremely problematic for a report to be written a week after an initial call. Um, significant details could be forgotten, you know, one week after the fact, you know, you have a lot of calls, you have a lot of interactions, you could be mixing up information that you, in your mind, right? So your memory is never going to be completely 100% accurate. So it is just problematic that there was kind of a week span between when he took the call and when he wrote the report. So that's a little bit odd. Yeah, because I was going to say, you think if you took the call and you make the report, be like simultaneously, like, you know, like together. You write down what the person's saying on the phone. You don't. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you don't talk talk to the person and then hang up and then like an hour later write down what that person said because you're gonna forget. Like you do it. Well, I mean, sometimes you can. I mean, sometimes like you can. I mean, I guess sometimes you can take notes like right after an incident. Like obviously, true. If you don't have a chance during the time, if you're responding to something, you can't take time away from that to write notes. But but you're encouraged to do it like. As soon as possible after. Yeah. And like a week is not like a, no. an acceptable amount of time. Um, no. Of course. So like, yeah, it's just kind of odd that it would have gone on a week with it before he wrote a report. And like I said, it was only because his superior and his supervisor asked him to do that, um, that he even did it. So if it wasn't for that, he wouldn't have even written one at all. But for whatever reason, if maybe he was remembering it wrong or maybe when he wrote this report, but he didn't seem completely... He didn't really believe what the girls were saying or some aspects of it. He just found kind of sketchy or odd because he just thought that there was something that they weren't telling him or something like that. Um, Again, I don't really know the details of what that was, but based on the reports, um, it seems that way. I think, too, because Jay had made contact with Monique just two hours before the 911 call was made, because she called at 3.30, and it was at 1.30 that he had called her, saying that, oh, you know, we're going for a joyride and all of that stuff. So because it had only been two hours, the boys weren't considered missing at that time. You know, it's only been two hours. Who knows? They could have just drank too much. They're somewhere else at another party. Like, I mean, we see that all the time. The police say you have to wait a certain amount of time before you file a report. You can't just go two hours. Um, before filing it. So I understand why it wouldn't have been filed. It wasn't even until the middle of the following day. So it was actually March 18th at like 2 p.m. when the search for the boys even started. So by this time, it would have been, you know, like 36 hours after they had been last seen on that surveillance footage. And, you know, a lot can happen in 36 hours. Um, But by this time, by 2 p.m. on the 18th, the boat that the boys allegedly had taken had been reported stolen. And so the police were looking for the boys in connection with that report. So it wasn't even necessarily for the boys' sort of well-being. It was kind of the fact that they had stolen this boat from the marina and they were looking for that boat. Um, and during her conversations with the police, so I'm not sure if it was during the initial 911 call or maybe it was later on in the investigation, like if they spoke to her again, but Monique had shared with the police that the night before the boys went missing, Jay, Chad, and Robbie had taken a water tricycle for a joyride. And then when they were done, they, quote, returned the tricycle to the marina, but did not tie it up properly to its post, end quote. So by the sounds of it, you know, going to this marina, taking some of the the boats out on a joyride was a common activity for them. They had done it before, at least once in the past, including the night before 
they had went missing. And that information about returning the tricycle that they had taken and not tying it up properly does tie in a little bit later, um, no pun intended, but does tie in a little bit later to um, something else that kind of comes up in, in, in the investigation. And so initially it kind of looks like a simple case, you know, three of the boys are seen on surveillance footage and steal a boat and some beer from the marina and maybe a water tricycle as well. And they had told Monique that they had stolen that same water tricycle the night before and that a motorboat can be heard starting its engine about an hour later and the boys have not been seen since then. So just based on those very logical and simple pieces, there's kind of a logical conclusion that the boys stole the boat went for the joy ride but then the question is why didn't they return and where are they now so the working theory i think at this time um, was that the boys had taken the boat and the police thought maybe they were just hiding out in fear of the consequences of their actions you know maybe they thought they would be in trouble maybe if they knew the police were out looking they were just kind of afraid to to come clean i guess so i don't really know if that was just the police after the fact saying that or if that really was what they were thinking at the time um, but the durham regional police were joined by the metro toronto marine unit and the coast guards among other resources in search for the boys but probably more important to them was the search for this missing boat because like i said they didn't really take this disappearance of the boys that seriously at the beginning at least an extensive search of the area came up empty-handed. There was no sign of the missing boat or the six teenage boys. So the coastline was searched extensively, you know, by sea and by helicopter. And during this initial search, there was a aqua cycle or water tricycle that was seen in the water about 20 meters from the shore. The choppy water conditions prevented searchers from re retrieving the cycle from the water, and it was never recovered or seen again after that. So whether this water tricycle that they saw was relevant to the disappearance or not has been kind of debated because some theorize that this could have been a different water tricycle that was stolen by the boys the night before they went missing. Remember, Monique said that the boys had told her that they returned it but may not have tied it up to its post. So that could have then washed away or floated away um, so that the one that they were seeing during this search was just the one from the previous night that had floated away. So it could have been completely irrelevant to the night that the boys went missing. I don't know if this is like relevant, but like, or like just me being like super techy or whatever, but do they have like serial numbers on like their water tricycles to like identify if like that was the one that the boys took or like that was just a random one that floated away? Well, well, like I said, like the, they weren't able to retrieve it from the water because I think oh, they, okay, yeah, the choppy waters, like they just weren't able to retrieve it, I guess just as because of the choppy water so they couldn't even like check it for a serial number so maybe it probably does have something on it but they mm. could just see like oh it looks like something like a water tricycle but they would never confirm like okay is this one that's related to this or is it a completely different one but so this water tricycle like because it fits six people on it um like, when i think of a tricycle like i think of like it's sm like it's small well, it's like, like I don't think of like a boat. I think if you look it up, like if you look up a water tricycle, like I mean, it's they're not like definitely not six people, like one person or two maybe, but um, not not six for sure. But they they also had the boat too, you know they could have had two on that and also two like like I said there was only three that were seen on the surveillance footage, so maybe three of them took the boat, three of them took the water tricycle. Like they could have split up, they could have been separated by this point. It could have been two groups of three, you know. And they never found the boat either. Um, I'll get I'll get into that. Oh, okay. Um, well, the answer is no. They never found the boat, but there's more information about that. So yeah, I guess the question here was like, was this water tricycle that they searchers had seen, was it the one that they stole the night before, that just floated away, or was this maybe one that was stolen by them that night that they disappeared? And so the fact that it is floating away, like that's relevant. That could lead to like. A theory about what happened to the boys but we don't really know because they didn't retrieve the water tricycle so they don't know which one it was maybe it could be a completely separate one that's not even related to the boys at all so we don't really know there's also information so i watched kind of like i said there's the main website um that bruce ricketts like the, the pi he, he kind of manages and has a lot of the timeline information and some of the documents from the case but he also did an interview um i don't I think for another podcast i watched the video um and so he does talk a little bit more about the details. There was also an alleged sighting 
of one of the boys in the beaches area of Toronto which, the day after they went missing. Um, one of the boys actually lived near that area. Um, so that's a little bit strange. So nothing really came of that. But there was also alleged sightings of the boys in New York shortly after the disappearance. Um, but to my knowledge, nothing ever came from this either. So there's a little bit odd that people, I guess, had maybe... You know, there was probably, you know, reports about the clothes that they were last seen wearing and maybe someone put it together based on the clothes they saw someone wearing and they looked like the boys. So they reported that they did see at least one of them in New York and also in Toronto. Um, but those have never been confirmed or led to anything substantial. Just a little bit something to note. And so authorities eventually call off the search only days later. So I think it's like 48 hours later. Um, there's no evidence or clues that are found. So after that water tricycle, there's nothing really that is found. No sign of the boys, nothing from the motorboat or anything else that leads to any more information in the case. Um, however, on March 29th, a gas can was spotted near Wilson, New York, which is 60 kilometers from Frenchman's Bay. So Pickering and Wilson are both located along the coast of Lake Ontario, but they're just on opposite ends, 60 kilometers apart. Lake Ontario is like kind of split down the middle. So half of it's on the US side, half of it's on the Canadian side. Um, so this would have floated pretty much if you look on a map, which I did look on Google Maps, like Wilson and Pickering are literally just right across the, the lake from each other, um, 60 kilometers apart. And so once this gas can was found, it, it led investigators down another path and maybe some more concrete evidence that the boys may have capsized or sunk in the boat and then drowned the night that they disappeared. So it has been alleged that it is the same gas can that belonged to that Boston whaler boat that the boys are thought to have stolen. The can actually had like ID markings that were bilingual and that suggests that it did come from Canada because it was marked in both English and French. Normally something, if it came from the US, it wouldn't have French on it. Um, it would probably just be in English. So the fact that it was English and French, they say, okay, this came from the Canadian side. Really? Things that come from the, the States don't have English or French on them? Well, French isn't one of their national languages. Like, obviously, here we're used to having everything in English and French because we have two national languages, but for the U.S., it would probably just be in English. That's how they were able to kind of say, like, okay, it probably came from the Canadian side versus it being from the U.S. side. There was an identical dent that was on this can. Um, as the one that was described to be on the can that was attached to the missing boat or associated with the missing boat. So it was a dent of the same size and location. So that's also something interesting. It'd be kind of a coincidence if there were two separate cans, but they just happen to have a dent of the same size at the, on the same place. That's kind of weird. And also the can was found like floating in the water without a cap. So it, there was no lid on it, and but it was empty. So it had no water in it or anything. So question is like how did the gas can get separated from the boat and where is the boat you know you could just think that the boat sunk after a crash or something um but the boat that was stolen by the boys um was actually a model known to be quote unsinkable um end quote so the unique features of this boat so boston whaler is like the model but um it's alleged that the one that was stolen wasn't an exactly a boston whaler it was like a replica model but it was something very similar and the boston whaler is an unsinkable boat that's kind of how it was marketed it has unique features that is allows it to remain afloat despite damage to its external or internal walls and also if it's filled up with water the outer layer of the boat is actually made out of styrofoam so this allows it to remain afloat even despite being filled with water um so you could even you know, suggested in, you know, the nighttime podcast did an episode on this case. And, you know, he's kind of describing it. Jordan, the host of that show is describing, it, you know, you could kind of like cut this, this boat down the middle. Um, and it would just be like two floating pieces and it wouldn't really sink very easily. Maybe eventually it would sink, but it would probably take some time because it would just end up being like styrofoam kind of floating. So even if the boy, boys did take the boat out, they crashed it for the boat to have completely sunk or not be found is also very odd. Investigators find it odd that the boat would never be recovered. Like during their search, if the boat was unsinkable, then you'd think it would just be found floating um, above the water surface. So the questions kind of just kept coming, like how did the gas can get separated from the boat and find its way to Wilson, New York, but the boat was never found at the bottom of the lake or even seen floating on the surface. So, and that, my, I guess my defense for that is like, well, 
they also said that the Titanic was unsinkable, and we all know how that happened. So just because I was just gonna say that, yeah, <laughs> I was like, they said like the Titanic was unsinkable, and look what happened there. The whole freaking thing sunk to the ground. Yeah, in, or to the into the water. Yeah, I, I, after one on its like maiden voyage too. Um, I feel like it. I feel like if you fill up a boat full of water, like eventually it's gonna sink. It just can't just be floating in the ocean forever. Like it would have to sink. Like it would deteriorate. Yeah, it would deteriorate, but it's also styrofoam, and that would take a long time to deteriorate. You would think so. Like they started searching like thirty six hours after the boys went missing. You'd think if they searched the whole lake thoroughly, they would have found it in their search. It wouldn't have sunk. Well, apparently it wouldn't have sunk in that short amount of time. So even if it would eventually sink, like it wouldn't have been in like the first couple of days. Like it could probably still remain afloat for at least a couple of days, um, despite being like damaged. And if there was water in it, you would still kind of see it. Or even if it was starting to sink, you might see like the top of it or like see it like right below the surface. You know what I mean? And also like you could think like with with the currents and stuff, it could have got it could have floated away to different locations but i'll also get a little bit into that as well too so like i said just because they said that this model of boat was unsinkable doesn't mean it actually was um maybe like maybe it did sink and their search was just not thorough enough at the bottom of the lake to find it um, according to marina staff the gas can that was on the boat had about three gallons of fuel in it which would would have been enough to travel about 25 miles so if the boys had taken the boat 25 miles would have been the furthest they would have been able to get um, on the boat and so 25 miles would have taken them close to Toronto if they were to travel west um, it would have taken them you know further down the Ontario coast and then 25 miles would have taken them like halfway across the lake because Wilson is about they're 60 kilometers from Pickering and they're both right on the coast on opposite ends so it would have been about 60 kilometers so if they only were able to travel 25 you know they would have gotten halfway through so if they ran out of gas and they got stuck and stranded in the middle of the ocean or in the middle of the lake. That's a possibility, but then how come there's no sign of the boat or anything like that? Also, another question that Bruce Ricketts has is how the can could have like got tossed overboard and then it floats around with the cap off in the choppy waters for nearly two weeks and then doesn't get any water inside of it. Like I said, it was found empty, but there was no cap on it. So you'd think, how did that not get filled with water and sink to the bottom? you think that surely would have happened. So for that two weeks later to be recovered above the surface, empty, with no water in it is very weird. Yeah, that is weird for, the, you, like, the gas can, right? That's what you're talking about? Yeah. That is weird, like, because you think water would get inside of it. It's yeah, floating like... in the ocean. Oh, it's just like an, yeah, it's just like an empty can that with no lid on it that's, like, rolling Like, anything you around. put in the water, like, even if you put something in, like, an open cup in the sink, it gets water in it. Yeah. And, like, 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 like weird. I mean, like... You know, an empty can that could be like light enough that it would float, but if it's like mm -hmm. chop, if it's like choppy waters, like apparently, if they saw that water tricycle but couldn't retrieve it because of the choppy waters, so obviously the water was choppy, so it would have been like rolling around and like how does it not get filled with water? So to, for it to be found empty is very strange. Mm -hmm. And in order for the can to float to the location that it was found in Wilson, New York, which is on the opposite side of the lake, there would have had to be winds and water currents in a particular direction. But there were no winds or currents in those directions in the two-week period of time between the boys disappearing and the recovery of the gas can that would have led to it floating to that location. So it is assumed by some that for the gas can to have ended up there where it was found, it would have had to be dropped at that location either with or without the boat. So very, very odd. And the main website on this case says, quote, another marina worker stated that given the currents and conditions the boat should have ended up in rochester new york end quote because rochester that's about 70 miles east of wilson where it was actually found or with the gas can um where the gas can was found right in wilson so if it was currents like it would have ended up should have ended up in rochester which would have been 70 miles from where it actually was and if the boat's going to float in that direction too it would have been in Rochester as well. And there was never any boat or wreckage of a boat that was ever reported to be found. So just kind of a very weird sort of set of circumstances. So either the boys did go that far in the boat on their joyride, or it got stuck in the middle, like I said, after getting halfway across, or it was the can was placed there after the fact. It's just very, very weird. And then after the recovery of the gas can, just weeks after the disappearance, the case goes cold, basically. They're 
were no additional leads, there were no signs of the boys, and no sign of the boat that they stole. So for three years, there was nothing else to go on, and they, there was n no action in the investigation because there was just nothing to go on. Um, but then in 1998, there were actually human remains that were found. So on April 10th, 1998, quote, a body of a male was recovered from the Niagara River near the water intake channel for Sir Adam Beck Hydro Generating Station by Niagara Regional Police, end quote. And so according to reports by the Ontario coroner, the following details about these remains were noted. And I took this right from this main website, so I'm just going to read kind of the list of identifying information about the remains. So age was estimated to be between 25 to 60 years of age, so a big range. Um, race was Caucasian. Height was 172 to 180 centimeters, which would be 5 foot 8 to 5 foot 11. Clothing, there was um, red Levi Strauss jean pants, 32 inch at the waist and a 31 inch inseam with a dark brown belt. White athletic socks with a red, white and blue stripe. Then there was a black wallet empty of contents that was also found. So they didn't find any like cards or anything in the wallet that would identify this person. But that was sort of the information they were able to gather from the coroner's office. And according to family members, this description does describe that of Jay Boyle. He was just 17, but was apparently quite strapping for his age. So he was six foot tall and 150 pounds. Part, part of the remains, like it was like a long bone that was actually found in a pair of red denim jeans. And these were jeans that were identical to a pair that Jay Boyle's mother bought for him prior to his disappearance and jeans that he was photographed wearing the night that he disappeared. So that's kind of odd. Like these were like brightly colored red pants, um, which wouldn't have been, I mean, maybe they were in style or maybe they were in fashion in the nineties, but how many people would go missing wearing red pants? So the fact that they're finding human remains partially encased in red Levi pants is significant, but the significance of the pants or the jeans was not known to be relevant until 15 years later because that's when Jay's family actually was made aware of the discovery of the remains and the pants in 2013. So why were they not notified at the time of the retrieval of the remains still remains a mystery. Um, why weren't the remains tested to confirm the identity? So to this day, no DNA has been extracted from the remains to determine who they belong to, despite being sent to a coroner's office in 2014. So private investigator Bruce Ricketts says that he was informed by the coroner in 2014 that the, quote, pants studied by the forensic anthropologist had a waterproof coating and cannot be a red Levi pair of jeans from the 1990s, end quote. So this led Ricketts to ask questions such as, you know, why was there a contradiction in description? So why was they said that they were red pants that were Levi Strauss pants? And then in 2014, the coroner's telling him that, no, that was a waterproof coating. It couldn't have been a red Levi pair of jeans. So there's two different pieces of information there. So who's right? Who is wrong? Um, are the remains that were recovered in 1998 the same ones that were viewed by the anthropologist in 2014? So just a lot of inconsistencies in this case. And like, kind of think, how could you get something wrong? Like it's either it's either that or it isn't, right? Like, are they red pants? Or are they not? So the fact that you know you could have two different experts years apart looking at it. I mean, I guess they could have different opinions, but the pants were either red or they're not, which is to me kind of weird. It's also weird too that the family wasn't notified that they found these remains. I mean, I mean at the time though, like they didn't know who the remains belonged to, so they had no reason to contact Jay's family. They aren't tying it necessarily to Jay's disappearance, and it's also Niagara, which is like a different region of Ontario. So they might not have been communicating with all the other jurisdictions, and you know they were reported missing in Durham region, right? So, you know the two counties could be like not communicating with each other, so. They find the pants and the body remains in Niagara, but they're not kind of tying it to these missing boys from another jurisdiction. So that's possible. But in any event, the family didn't even find out that there were these remains that were found until like 15 years after they were found, which is also crazy. What? Really? Yeah. So that's they didn't. Crazy. Yeah, they didn't find out until 2013 that the oh were found in 1998. Why wait that? Like, why hold that information? Well, that long. I mean, like, again, like I said, like, at the time that they were found, like, they didn't know who they belonged to. So they didn't have a reason to think like, oh, it could be this missing boy from another region. Like, they're two different jurisdictions, so they might not have been communicating with each other. But also, yeah, just the fact that it was 15 years is like, 
crazy to me. That's a super long time. And so you can imagine the family, you know, 15 years later, they're like, there's this huge piece of information that could be relevant. And we just were never told about it. So it's just like kind of shocking to even think that that would happen. But in 2014, just before the 19th anniversary of the disappearances, Jay's family started a change.org petition fighting for police to finally test the DNA of the remains. Bruce Ricketts, the PI, met with investigators during the course of his private investigation and was told in this meeting that one of the reasons for the delay in DNA testing is because the coroner's office did not receive the evidence box from the Niagara Regional Police Service and even said that they, quote, could not find the box, end quote, until a long time after the initial discovery of the remains. (laughs) So... The Niagara Region Police Service even stated in a memo to investigators that the box was actually in the custody of the Hamilton Hospital Pathology Department, but that hospital's chief pathologist says that it was never there, it was never in their possession, and there's no way that a box would be kept in this department for 16 years without a secured lockbox location to keep it in. So it seems like the evidence discovered in the lake was handed from person to person, from region to region until it eventually got lost, and therefore no one really knows where it went or you know, if it could have been tampered with in any fashion during that time. So because of this, it's hard to believe anything that the police say, as they seem completely incompetent at even transferring over evidence properly. So the investigator also noticed a discrepancy in the age range of the human remains. So the initial report said between 25 and 60 years, and then in 2014, it was changed to 29 to 47 years. So it's kind of weird that that would also be different. Also keep in mind, these all are ages that are outside of Jay Boyle's age range or any of the boys. So the boys were all like 16 to 18. So even if it's 29 to 47, like that's still above the age group of these boys. So wouldn't really fit. But I think the point is, is that there's like two different jurisdictions coming to different conclusions about the age range of these remains, which just seems weird. And then they're losing evidence along the way and don't seem even interested in a lot of it throughout the initial investigation. So just a lot of like really weird kind of dropping the ball along the way by many different people, it seems. So this is just the beginning in a series of police misconducts throughout the course in this investigation. So like I said, there was the initial apathy by police after receiving the call, then the fact that they called off the search after only 48 hours, then there's the lack of communication, there's lots of miscommunication, and the apparent loss of some of the key pieces of evidence, like the remains that were found in 1998. Bruce Ricketts has been met with resistance throughout the course of his investigation by the police as well. And this includes having to submit three separate access to information requests before finally being sent the surveillance footage of the marina that night that the boys went missing. So it's like, remember I said that he actually received a copy of the surveillance footage where he saw the, all these kind of events that were happening at the marina that night. And even that took him a long time to actually get that footage. And it took him three attempts because you're supposed to be you know, the Freedom of Information Act, you should be able to request these like public documents and they should be sent to you relatively quickly. Um, but it took him three three attempts, which is crazy. And then like the first time he requested it, he was told that there was no footage from the marina that night. And then on his third request, he was successful in getting it. So was the first person he spoke to just misinformed or were they lying? Um, like why would he be resistance in being sent that video? It doesn't really make sense unless the police had something that they wanted to hide or something. Um, The only reason he knew that the video did exist was because the boys' families were all shown the video shortly after they went missing in 1995. So if it wasn't for that, like, he wouldn't have even known that there was video footage of that night and may have never gotten to see it for himself. So you can tell it's just like, they're kind of being kind of hush-hush and very weird about the situation. And we don't really know why. Like, we don't have any reason to think that the police are trying to hide something or that they're lying purposely but it just seems like you know and especially as the years go on like you know people retire it's different police officers so they're not aware of the case or the initial reports and it takes a lot of digging so it might just be easier for them to sort of avoid it than trying to kind of drudge it all up again i feel like we always see this in like a lot of cases that we've done or just cases in general that like please like they always seem like they're hiding something or they're not like not being fully truthful in like the information that they're letting people know and i always find like when someone retires and someone new come new comes into like the like the mix or whatever it's hard to like know what information was told to them or like what evidence was given to them like it's so hard when so many different people are in and out of this investigation to get the actual story straight of what actually 
is going on or being investigated. Which is frustrating because you want to know what's going on and the families want to know, but I always feel like they always seem to be hiding something, but sometimes it's just miscommunication. Or they're, maybe they are hiding something. Who knows? We have seen a lot of shoddy police work in the cases we've done in the past, so it's hard to say. Yeah. And like I, like I said, I don't really have anything conclusive to say. Like, the police are lying, but yeah, it's just... And like, you know, initially, like I was talking, that initial officer didn't even make a report until a week later of the initial call. So there's probably a lot of times throughout this when reports weren't filed properly or there was a delay. And so even people like later on, like 15, 20 years later, when it's all new people who weren't there initially, they can't even go back and necessarily find records of it because they're probably like missing or they're not complete or something, right? So even if people wanted to go and take a look like retrospectively, like it's hard to even do that when you don't have like a full amount of information and like not saying that that happened, but I mean, we saw that that one officer didn't even do the report until a week later. So who knows how many other times that happened throughout the course. So overall, many questions still remain in this case. So, you know, why were there no bodies of any of the boys that were recovered from the lake? I mean, those remains that were found, you know, the genes are believed, you know, Jay Boyle, one of the missing boys, did have red genes on uh, reportedly the night he went missing. Um, and then these remains do turn up, you know, three years later with the red pair of jeans on um, and the black belt or the, the dark belt that matched the, the description of Jay's belt as well. So that's very odd, but there were no other bodies or any parts of other bodies or anything that were ever recovered from the lake. And why has the boat never been recovered? Any searches of the lake have never come up with any pieces of the boat. So even if the boat did break apart, even if, you know, there's still be pieces of it, you'd think somewhere that would kind of wash up. How did the gas can get to Wilson, New York? We still don't know that. Why were the remains that were discovered never tested for, for years? They were never tested. So it's also crazy that the family also had to put up a change.org petition to get the DNA tested, which is crazy. Like they just sat in a lab for 14 years or 15 years without being tested. And also the inconsistency of information, like they first said it was red Levi Strauss pants. And then later on, they said that that was just waterproof coating, that it wasn't like, red jeans. It was I was going to say, like, it's either red or it's not red. Like you can't get those mixed up. I mean, maybe it was faded because of being in the water for so long but red is red you can't really make those things up yeah really. exactly and also like i was saying like red pants aren't necessarily super popular i mean maybe they were in the 90s i don't know but i'm just saying how many people wearing red pants also go missing so the fact that you have a body turning up with red pants on like that kind of would narrow down the possible options and the same belt right you said that he was wearing the same belt yeah like similar belt like it was like a similar dark belt, colored yeah, I mean. belt yeah well there was a there was a uh, wallet that was also found in the pants i believe or with these remains but that wallet was empty so there was no like id cards or anything that they could find so they couldn't identify. Well, that's unfortunate yeah so also why was the wallet empty i mean i guess it could have just if it's been in the water for three years like or if someone took all the evidence in it yeah, like if there was someone involved, if there was someone involved, there was foul play, like they could have emptied the wallet before they dumped the body in the water too, um, so that no one would find the body or be able to identify the body. But also, why would you just empty the wallet and then put the wallet in the pants? Like if you're going to do that, you could just take the wallet. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't know if you mentioned this and or if you will mention this, like did they ever think foul play or they just thought they were just missing and like something like natural happened to them, like they drowned or... Well, I, th I think the police always just thought they, like, capsized and drowned and, like, they crashed and that night. But there's never been anything to prove that. So one of the points that uh, the PI brings up is, like, the PI isn't really suggesting that it is foul play or there's something. But he's just kind of saying, like, you can't conclude that they just capsized and drowned when you have no evidence to suggest that. So they're kind of going with that theory, even though they don't have anything. Like, they've never found anything. The only thing they ever found was the gas can that they tied to that boat or like that was tied to that boat you know they think it's from that same boat that went missing they found the gas can but never any bodies also not even though they did not find the bodies they never found like jackets or hats and this was march so they would have been wearing jackets you know it's like still kind of cold in ontario in march it's like spring so they'd be wearing coats or hats or like shoes nothing was ever found like no shoes or anything like that other than the body that was found in 98 with the red pants so how do like six bodies go drown 
And also, there were uh, allegedly like two of the boys had experience on boats before, so like they weren't like completely newbies on boats. So even the fact that they did capsize is also weird. Not impossible, obviously they could have, but yeah, like I, I was just gonna say, like it's very like I found it very suspicious that all six of them would have drowned, especially if two of them were yeah. experienced boaters. Like it's yeah. very rare that if you have a boat crash and everybody dies in a boat. And, well, I mean, it had it has happened. But what I'm saying, like, it's very odd to me that all six of them just it drowned and nobody found any evidence of anything. Like, that's just weird to me. Yeah, like, if they did all drown, like, fine. But then how do you could say that they never found anything? No pants, no, no, like, coats, no, nothing. No, or no sign of boat. any. Or even the boat. Yeah, and the boat itself. They never found any of the boat. Like, like the boat would have to, uh, well, like you said, like, we went back to this before, like, either still floating out there or sunk somewhere but you still have to, like like a, a in the missing is well, weird. yeah like in the 48 hour time frame or like so they started the search like 36 hours or so after the boys went missing and then they searched for 48 hours after that in that time frame the boat like obviously it's going to eventually sink or like just float away but like i still think that that was within a short enough amount of time where the boat should have still been able to be found like above the surface like it's not going to sink that quickly probably if it's deemed unsinkable i mean it's possible who knows but like the fact that there was never any reports ever that the a boat or the piece of a piece of the boat or anything or anything else from inside the boat was ever found it was just the gas can that was empty with no water in it yeah that was supposedly floating around it doesn't know, make it, like this whole thing doesn't make sense like they could have just drowned and because like in, or in the boat just sunk because or because there's no evidence of either of that. No bodies, no boat. So like obviously yeah. something more sinister happened because yeah, like how do you how did the whole boat go missing and never been found? Like that doesn't happen. Yeah, never never been found. And like, like I'm so intrigued. Like I'm I have more questions than I have answers. I know, and that's the thing with this case is like there, there's so much we we don't know and like how can you okay like a, a gas can an empty gas can is going to float around and roll around in choppy water for two weeks and have no water in it whatsoever after two weeks and not sink like you'd think it would just immediately fill up with water if it had an open top well because if it had holes in it or anything like it would have it would sink well, it didn't have like the only hole like the only opening would have been like the top no, but the if it was like the cap should have been yeah, but if it was, like, chopping around in the waters and, like, it got, like, snagged on, like, a rock or something and, like, poked a hole in it or whatever. But it, but whatever. it didn't because there's pictures of the gas can. Like, they retrieved oh, okay. it. There was, like, a dent, like, a small dent that you can't really notice. But still, you think it would fill up with water, it would sink. Exactly. So, it's just weird that they would have found that. But, I mean, and, like, they Plus tied it. placed there, like. Yeah, and, and then why would you have placed it there? And also, it's, like, they say, like the winds and the currents like aren't consistent with how it could have ended up in Wilson. Like if it's going to be taken by the current, it's going to end up in Rochester, which is 70 miles from Wilson. Like they just say, even that part of it doesn't make sense that it would be found where it was found, even if it did float away. But I also find it hard that it would just float away, be in the ocean for two or be in the lake for two weeks, you know, with an open I top. I think we have to look back at those surveillance cameras of those like other witnesses or suspects or not suspects but those other people that were there before the boys got there and then afterwards yeah like those two people that were there before like with that bag like mm -hmm. they never really looked into that so i feel like that's someone they should start because those people could know something or seen something or be part of this whole mystery it's very you know it's very likely or possible that they are completely unrelated those other people that were there but i mean you should at least talk to them maybe they you know if they had interviewed them like right away like you know in the first few days after like you know the people could have seen something that maybe they thought was insignificant but then when they could talk about it they could be like oh yeah that was kind of weird like i did see a group of boys here or i did hear them over here you know like anything but i don't have anything to suggest that they actually did talk to any of those people i can't say they didn't but i just don't really believe that they would have considering they didn't even want to look for the boys for the first 36 hours and only did so when the boat was reported missing. It wasn't out of concern for the boys. It was mostly just because the boat was missing, probably. Did they ever, ever talk to anybody at the party? Like, the witnesses of, like, when the boys left? Like, like you said, like, would, did they argue with other people at the party or anything? Like, did they talk to anybody? 
Because that's also where you would start, too. Yeah, well, I mean, like, they did talk, like, I remember I said at the beginning, like, the people who at the party did say to the investigators that, you know, the, um, the boys said that they were going to go goof off at the marina. Or, uh, that's what they said before they left. But there was no, they didn't go specifically saying, like, oh, we're going to meet this person here, or we're going to do this. They just said we're going to goof around. Um, so, obviously, the that's in kind of like the record so obviously someone did talk to police about that so they must have interviewed people from the party but nothing that really led to anything significant and like i said at the beginning like there are some discrepancies in the details of that night that are frustrating and somewhat hard to navigate so one example of that is that the official website about this disappearance that i've been talking about which is managed by bruce wickets mentions details of a physical altercation between jay and danny at the party that night. The website says that after the fight, Danny left to go seek out the help of a mutual friend of his and Jay's to, quote, intercede, end quote, between them. It says that Danny and the friend then returned to the party, but by that time, people had left for another location. So then Danny and the friend went to another friend's house, but then later separated, and Danny was never seen again. But other sources besides this website have no mention about this fight between the boys. And then... In an interview with Bruce Ricketts himself, so the one that I watched where he was talking to a couple of other people on a podcast, um, you know, the interviewer asked if it was possible that maybe one of the boys was harmed by another one of the boys that night, and then maybe things escalated, and Bruce says that there's no evidence of that, and that all six boys were great friends. So, like, which was true? Like, were they all great friends and everything was great, or did two of them have a fight and there was tension? Like, Then why do all six go missing, though? If two people had a fight and there was some like yeah. tension between the two that's two people out of out of six that's still four people that are missing but i'm just thinking like maybe How like does... maybe the six of them did go on the boat and then two of them like maybe they maybe. fought and like one of them ended up dead something or happened. something and then like it's like one of them ended up dead and then because one of the theories too was that like because somebody had spotted them in new york apparently like shortly after they disappeared and then somebody said they saw them in in the beaches area of toronto um they said like oh maybe like you know something happened that night and then the boys like fled and like made it to the states like maybe they took the boat to new york they made it there and then just took off and like disappeared but that's kind of weird too like they wouldn't have really felt like they would have done that and then they would have found the boat yeah exactly there's no boat there's no people yeah they ditched the boat somewhere the boat still would have been found by somebody or some somehow somewhere yeah or unless it's like no boat, so. well because like in that interview that they do with bruce as well like the interviewer mentions like maybe somebody found a boat floating and like saw oh this is a free boat you know what i mean like then painted it over and gave it a different serial number and then just used it maybe and like it so it's possible it could have been found but it just never was reported because there also wasn't a ton of information about this case like initially maybe in pickering but like no one in new york cared i doubt about this case so like if someone on the new york side had seen a boat floating they're not going to say oh this is about maybe this is the missing boat from those six boys like they probably would have never even heard of the case so they could have just found it's like oh free boat maybe if there was no signs of any like struggle or there was no like suspicious thing about it it was just like a boat floating instead of returning it or reporting it they would have just like taken it and maybe used it you know so just because it wasn't reported doesn't mean it was never found like it could have been found i just i think this whole thing just revolves around the boat I think if we find the boat, we find the people. And that's what I'm sticking to. Yeah. I just find <laughs> I mean, it... there could be other things on, but that's, in my mind, that's what I'm sticking to. Like, the boat needs to be found so we get some information. I don't know, do you agree? Like, I don't, like, it just seems weird to me. Yeah. The whole I... big boat goes missing. Like, I don't understand how it happened. It's just odd that the boat and six bodies just get never get found, ever. So, yeah, like, uh, like I said, there was, like, kind of discrepancies in the information. So, also in that interview, Bruce mentions, like, on the night that the boys disappeared, it was just the one boat, the Boston Whaler, that was stolen. He says the water tricycle was taken the night before from a different marina, but the official timeline on the main website still has that information about the water tricycle being stolen that night by the boys and it being found by the searchers who couldn't recover it. But I haven't been able to see that other information anywhere else, so it's kind of hard even like among the same... like. It's still him both times. It's just kind of a discrepancy in the same information. So maybe the website hasn't been updated in a while because this interview was like 2022. It was just last year. And the website, who knows, could have been longer. So, 
even if you look on the website and then you hear his interview, like some of the information maybe is a little bit hard to follow. Um, so it seems contradictory and it's hard to discern what the correct timeline really is. Um, but I will say the website does provide some good documentation, such as police notes and reports from the case and also some photos that are worth taking a look at. So we'll link the um, we'll link the website and all of our sources like we always do in the show notes. But I definitely recommend taking a look at the website because it has some some good information on it, even if it is a little bit confusing. Like I listened to like three different podcast episodes on this case and the information is like slightly different. One podcast or YouTube channel called the Jay's girlfriend, Monica, but then on the website, it, her name is Monique. And it's just weird that that would be different information. Like, you know, it's not that hard to, to say what someone's name is. So I don't know why it's different on the two sources, but it is. So it's a kind of like a weird kind of thing where there's a lot of sort of information that I don't know how much of it is true or what's been updated and what hasn't. Cause there's not a ton of, like there's some local news articles from like the Durham region paper that talks about like the anniversary of the case coming up and Bruce Ricketts and his investigation. But if you're going to like try to find an actual documentary or like an article from like a national paper, like it's just not going to happen. So a lot of people don't even know about this case and, so there's not a lot of information to kind of corroborate. So it's just kind of yeah, like... Yeah, because I've never heard of it, so... Yeah, me neither. And like, and I wish I had. It's yeah. Super interesting. It's crazy. Like, we could probably do a documentary series on it because it's so crazy. But I just... It's just mysterious. And I just... It's just hard when you don't have a lot of information to go on because you kind of have to... can only go on the information that's there. And you can't really corroborate it with anything because there's nothing else to corroborate it with. So I'm just kind of going based on what this PI is saying. The point is... We don't know what happened if they capsized, if the boat sunk, or if there was foul play involved. Like, it's just weird. Six boys and a boat went missing, and no sign of any of them. Unless those remains that they found in 98 was from one of the boys, but we can't even definitively say that because there's just nothing that ever really came out conclusively about that. So it's just very odd. Very Super odd. strange. Yeah. So, I mean, what is your theory? Like, you think that there was foul play, or do you think it was just they well, it, crashed and? I don't. I don't think they crashed because I feel like the to crash a boat, the boat would still be wherever they crashed it because it'd be like broken or whatever. So, to me, like, I feel like something more like tragic happened. I mean, it's tragic that they crashed and they died, but that's also tragic. But I feel like you don't just have six boys gone missing and like a boat missing. Because if they crashed, the boat would would have been in the water still. And the bodies would have been either there or, like, floating somewhere after all these, this time. So. Yeah. And, like, if they did, like, an extensive search of the water, like they said they did, and they were in that 60-mile radius between, you know, Wilson, New York, where the gas can was found, and Pickering, where the boat was stolen from. Like, if they're doing an extensive search of that area, they should have found something. There's six bodies and a boat you don't find anything or like even the things from the boat no no clothing like i said no hats no coats no shoes anything so just very odd i mean and there also there's talk in that interview with bruce ricketts about like there are experts that say like in really cold water because it's still march like in lake ontario so it's still gonna be cold and like near freezing temperatures probably or a little above but there is like experts who say like when there's water when it's really cold water like bodies can sink to the bottom in that temperature and then never be recovered or like never be floated to the never, never float to the top so it is possible they just floated to the bottom i can't see all six of them floating to the bottom but even if a couple of them did there still should be some that are still floating somewhere and i mean you can't necessarily search the entire bottom of the lake like i understand that if things sink it's going to be harder to find them but I just can't, it's hard to fathom that like six bodies could just go overboard or capsize on a boat and have nothing be found from them ever. And now it's like, that was in 95. So we're, you know, we're coming up on 30 years in a couple of years, it's going to be 30 years, you know, and in a couple of weeks from this recording, it's going to be the, the 28th anniversary of it. Uh, Cause they went missing March 17th, like the early morning of March 17th. So just um, very odd and very bizarre. So I don't really know what my theory is. I think, you know, you could probably just assume that, you know, they stole the boat. Maybe they were drinking a lot. They went out. The water was choppier than they thought. Went overboard. But that doesn't explain the boat never being found. Or that doesn't explain 
no bodies being recovered. So, but I also have nothing to say that it was foul play either. I can't say, oh, that the, I think this person's a suspect or this person, like, there's nothing to suggest that either. And also, how does six people get killed? Like, if it's foul play, like, if it's one person, you might think, but like, how are six people going to be murdered? Like, you know, if one person did that, like, that's kind of hard to believe. So it would have had to been like a yeah, larger Yeah, that kind of like goes back to like the one that me and Katie did a couple week of, weeks ago where like two people got killed by what we're assuming one person. Yeah. Like, so what did they come across another boat filled with a large group of people who then killed six boys? That's what I mean. Like, it doesn't make but sense. Still, there would still be bodies unless they. Well, they, they the took the bodies. And, yeah. But like, that seems far fetched. Unless they're. Hiding the boat somewhere. Yeah, then they took the boat too. Yeah, like again, like it's so many questions. You have to, you have to tow the boat. Yeah. Or unless, or somebody drives the boat, I guess. Yeah, and like I know they said that the, like the gas can had, like enough for twenty five miles, and I don't know how much was in the actual boat itself. So, if there was twenty five in the gas can, and then maybe some in the boat, you could make it the full sixty, to sixty miles to get across the river, uh, or to, sorry, to get across the lake. Um. So I don't know. Yeah, it's just so many questions. So I can't even like put it in my mind. Like it probably really makes sense. Like, yes, the boys probably stole the boat that night. Like that's probably what happened just based on the fact that they were at the marina on the surveillance footage, three of them, the boats were reported missing. Like that's probably the case. And also like Jay telling his, his girlfriend Monique that, you know, they had going to go for a joyride and like, she knows that they had stolen stuff before. So that's probably what happens. But once they get into the boat away from the marina, who knows? Neither scenario makes sense. Like, it doesn't make sense that they met a large group of people who then killed them, took their bodies and the boat, and hid them all. Like, that's far-fetched. So you have to naturally believe that they must have just capsized if it was choppy. But then the boat should still be recovered, or the bodies. Like, it doesn't make sense. Either scenario doesn't make sense. So it's very weird. Yeah, that's why I wanted to do this case, because it's just many questions and not a lot of answers. And vague information and the information that's out there it's hard to kind of say definitively what's actually true because this is all the work of a pi too right so he has different sort of levels of information or access than like a regular like police investigator would have so it's just confusing yeah so um just a very very weird case and um still unsolved and the boys the six boys are still considered missing to this day anyone with any information that might assist investigators in this case is asked to contact the durham regional police services at 1-888-579-1520 extension 2511 again that's 1-888-579-1520 extension 2511 crazy case and hopefully it can get solved for closure for the families like i said it's now been 30 years and it's just hard the longer you go the uh, more unlikely that it will get resolved but hopefully somebody might know something or know somebody who knows something so the more people that kind of know about this case uh the more chance that maybe something can lead to closure um so yeah, definitely bizarre. That does it for, for this week's episode of Crime Family. So thanks so much for, for tuning in. So if you are a fan and you want to support us on Patreon, you can join us on tiers one, two, and three and get exclusive extras you can't get anywhere else. So that's on patreon.com slash crimefamilypodcast. We're also on Redbubble. We have the merch store there. So if you want to support the show and get some Crime Family merch, we'll put the link to the show notes for the merch store as well. And we thank everyone who, who buys merch and supports the show. And we'll be back with a new episode next week. Um, hopefully Katie will be here for that. Um, hopefully she can join us for that. But we definitely hope you will join us uh, for a new episode next week. So thanks so much. And until next time, take care. Bye. Bye.